Good evening and welcome to our first TED Ed evening at Southside High School. My name is Christine Brown. And I'm Nicole Noor. And we are the advisors of the TED Ed Club. For those who are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Before we begin, we would like to thank both our central and high school administration for their support throughout this process. Special thanks to Bob Kroger, Lauren Reed, Rob Lichter, and the Video Club for the technical support. Many thanks to our TED Ed production crew. Also special thanks to Anthony Capuccio for his assistance with the set. Most importantly though, thank you to the talented students and faculty who are taking part in this special event tonight. When the idea of a TED Ed Club was first presented to us, we were curious, excited, a bit nervous all at the same time. I think that my friends here in the front could agree with that. Um, but we certainly have seen our share of TED Talks over the years, but we were unaware of the curriculum and resources that were available to our students so that they could have the opportunity to identify their passions and develop their ideas worth sharing. The materials that we received from TED Ed helped guide our students through 13 explorations that encouraged discovery, rich discussions, self-reflection, research, and collaboration. Thank you to Mr. Gavin and Nicole Moriarty for introducing TED Ed to the Rockville Center School District. We are grateful to have been on this journey with some amazing students and faculty, and we are so very proud of their work. We're quite sure that you will be impressed as our speakers and tonight's presentation. Okay. So we would now like to welcome to the stage our first presenter, Orly Maurice. Hello everyone. I invite you to realize that the average person says about 8,560,000 words in their lifetime. In my particular life, three words seem to reside. I hate autism. And before you call me an ableist or whatever conventional term you deem fit to categorize the uncomfortable position I've put you in, sorry about that, I invite you to realize that this does bear some understanding. My parents were not exactly the Sears catalog of parenting, but they did their best. They did not have the opportunities that I had. You see, my mother, I always strive to have her core values, but I realized that when anybody asked me to describe her, I would say strong, 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 strong. But buildings are meant to be strong, not people. She changed me. And before I start, I would like to say that I could have pulled many cards. I could have spoken about my experience going to predominantly white schools my, most of my life and how those spaces single-handedly contributed to a lot of the self-hatred I possess, how I had to unlearn a lot of the behaviors and insecurities that I had. It changed me. How I moved to a new country with new values and new people and how I had to learn to acclimate to all of those things, whether that be language-wise, traditions-wise, they changed me. You, however, did not feel like a sympathy card that I got to procure. You were a part of me. You changed me. You see, sometimes you aren't aware you have a paper cut until you use hand sanitizer. It's the burn of the wound that makes you that much more aware of all the wounds you'll never be able to decipher. But now it hurts so much and the intensity of the pain starts to get stronger and stronger when a second ago you had no idea the pain even existed and now the feeling is all but minor. 
I've come to realize that this is what it means to heal. Sometimes you don't even know there's a part of you that hurts, a part that longs to be held and nurtured, until something comes along that forces you to become aware of it. You now have to fight all the countless demons that you thought you hid. When you came into my life, I thought I wasn't worthy of love. I felt consistently alone when push came to shove. And I must admit, I resented you. Everyone treated you the way that I dreamed for me. And I begged for that happiness, that false sense of security. But then you looked at me. And it was the way you looked at me that made me feel seen. And I know what you may think, but this is not about a friend or a boy I met when I was 13. This is about my brother Christian, my very own source of dopamine. You were diagnosed with autism at the age of five, and all of us were scared of how this would affect your life. You proved us all wrong, of course, continuing to thrive. But I now had to step up and be the big sister you needed me to be. My sole priority, mine. But I never would have fathomed the life that I had to grieve of leaving behind. You see, our parents couldn't afford to have a babysitter, but they could afford to expend my childhood to meet your needs. So I went to the bus stops, attended the meetings, kept track of the IEP. I resented how much my world was you. But as I grew up, our bond strengthened, some even saying that we were each other's backup. The thing was that Everyone would say that I was a role model for you, but you were the blueprint of who I wanted to be. You taught me cheerfulness, see? Choosing to recognize that even in the darkest of times, that there is light, that there is something to see in spite of it all. Honesty, H, honing in on the things that make us who we are, and understanding that our individuality is a superpower. Respect, realizing that those differences, <laughs> although they may seem to be polarizing at times, are in fact what unite us. Intelligence, understanding that intelligence is much more than what we read in books or the vocabulary that we use but can really be stemmed from the experiences we have in teaching those experiences to others to foster empathy. And sensibility, S. Skillfully making decisions so that we understand the impact that they have on our lives, but on the lives of others as well. When it came time for you to move away, I was now tasked with finding who I was outside of you. And believe me, it's hard. I'm excited for college. But I now am forced to go into this new chapter, still loving you. See, that's one thing they don't necessarily tell you about healing. It's never truly done. You just find things that ease the feeling. Three words. You made me. Thank you. Thank you. I now would like to welcome to the TED Red Circle, Mr. Kevin Downey. It was a snowy evening. We had all just received the much anticipated and much celebrated robocall from the district, letting us know that school was closed due to the blizzard. While most were turning off their alarms and turning on their favorite show on Netflix, I was making sure that my alarms were set and all my gear was together. When my alarms went off the following morning, well before first light, I woke up and turned to my wife and said, I'm going to the beach. I'm a surf photographer, and when the forecast calls for bad storms and Mother Nature is throwing its worst at us, my favorite place to be is in the ocean. Hurricanes, blizzards, nor'easters, and other weather events bring rough seas but with perfect conditions, the ocean could be a beautiful place. My love for the ocean came early. 
Growing up on Long Island brought great memories of family trips to the beach, and I can still remember my dad teaching me how to dive under a wave to avoid its power. Many years working as a lifeguard built up my strength as a swimmer, and early on I brought a small GoPro camera with me when swimming around in the ocean to snap some pictures. As years went by, I became friendly with some surf photographers and surfers in the Long Beach and Point Lookout area, and one of them put me in touch with someone who was looking to sell their professional equipment, and that's when my hobby really took off. I shoot with the Canon 1D Mark IV camera housed in an SPL waterproof housing custom made from powder coated aluminum. Each piece of metal is sheared to length, bent on a 25 ton press, and then hand welded. From there, the housing is sanded, covered in a special coating to prevent rusting, and then painted in powder coat paint. The camera is placed in the housing and hooked up to a trigger system and grip handle to hold when I'm taking pictures. When the trigger is held down, the camera takes around seven pictures per second to freeze the action frame by frame. Depending on what lens is being used, a custom port is placed over the housing and sealed with the rubber gasket to, to prevent any leakage. The port, each port is covered in a special coating to prevent the water from sticking to it so the water beads off so as not to ruin the shot. The entire rig weighs approximately 10 pounds, but due to its design, it floats on top of the water. The housing itself is tethered to my wrist with a thick strap so I don't lose hold of it when going over or under a wave. I always wear a pair of ocean swim fins, which are also tethered to my ankle, in case they get ripped off during a, a heavy wave. They are my lifeline and allow me to swim around the ocean and over under waves quickly and efficiently. Depending on how cold the water is, I have a variety of different wetsuit thicknesses, along with gloves, booties, and a hood for winter swims, when the water is in the 40s and the air temperature is in the teens and 20s. In any given session, I, I spend between two and three hours swimming around, taking anywhere between 750 and 1,000 photos. Getting in the right spot involves a lot of patience and then a lot of quick positioning. The idea is to capture the wave or surfer in its purest form, so staying out of the way of a rapidly moving surfboard is just as important as getting the right shot. Most of the photos are taken blind, meaning I'm not looking through the viewfinder when taking the picture. This is referred to as spray and pray, and it's not until I get out of the water and look at the back of the camera that I determine if I got any usable photos. A good session would leave me with between five and 10 photos, usable photos, so this is a very low percentage activity, but the feeling of getting that perfect shot is unmatched. Surf photography gives a perspective that few get to see. From the beach, a wave looks rolling and placid, but from the ocean, it is intense, violent, and chaotic. The power and energy of all that moving water is incredible, and it's easy to get sucked under, held down, and tossed around like a rag doll. At times, you feel completely at the mercy of the power of the ocean, but the feeling of swimming around, going over and under waves, and looking for that perfect shot is like a dance, and when done right, it is euphoric. At the end of a session, I often walk off the beach cold, exhausted, and with my legs feeling like jello. That night, when I lay in bed, I often feel like I'm still in the water, bobbing up and down over the passing waves. To end, a confession, a warning, and some advice. I confess that I have not been in the water in too long. I've been spending as much time with my wife and young daughter, but I have hopes that she joins me in the water someday. My warning is do not try this at home. If you are considering getting into surf photography, you must be an exceptional ocean swimmer before you become an exceptional photographer. Swimming in the ocean during a hurricane, completely alone, without any surfer, without any lifeguard standing by, without any board of flotation device, while dragging around a 10 pound metal box with one arm and going over and under waves is extremely dangerous. The ocean is not to be messed with. There are no breaks, no timeouts, and no let-up. The ocean keeps coming at you no matter what. I have been caught in rip currents, pulled hundreds of yards down the beach, had my swim fins ripped off by a crashing wave, 
gotten stuck out beyond the breakers and gotten stuck in, beyond the breakers. Each time I kept my cool and relied on my skills as a surfer, but there were scary occurrences. As with anything in life, know your limits and be smart. Lastly, my advice is to live in the moment. Surf photography captures a moment in time that few get to see or experience. Photography is all about perspective, and the ability to tell a story with a picture is powerful. Enjoy the small times, as in the curling of a wave, and appreciate your surroundings. Getting outside your comfort zone and connecting with nature is therapeutic, and there's a lot that we can learn from the ocean. The ocean is consistent. Day and night, all year round, the ocean is moving and producing beautiful waves, many of which will never be seen or written or even talked about, which is a hauntingly humbling concept. Despite its consistency, the ocean is always different. No two waves are the same, and no two days swimming around the ocean are the same. In life, even when you feel like you are constantly grinding through day by day, there is variety, beauty, and creativity to be found. You just have to look for it. So on that next snow day or that next day off from work, get outside. Capture those milliseconds that matter. Appreciate everything around you. Step outside your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to try a new hobby or experience, and be good to those around you. Thank you and good night. So much, Mr. Downey. Okay, we would now like to welcome to the stage Mia Reisert. When I was in seventh grade, I came home from school one day, marched up to my mother and said, I want to join the wrestling team. After some hesitation, I met with my guidance counselor the next day, who said, that's great. You're the first girl on the team. It seems so obvious at the moment, like it would be a missed opportunity if I didn't take on this challenge. Even still today, I don't understand exactly why I was a wrestler, but I'm grateful for the experience that I had. I look back on younger me, me from 2018 on my first day of practice. I can remember being very nervous the whole day and really feeling alone. I can remember sitting in the corner, lacing up my shoes and contemplating my life choices. It was really lonely being the only girl on the team. All the other boys had their friends, the coaches. They didn't seem as scared as I was. I was terrified out of my mind. But when I stepped on the mat, some confidence built inside of me and I wasn't so scared anymore. That was until we started having meets, which was facing an entirely new challenge. Going against someone who I've never met before, someone who I don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Going into it knowing that these are gonna be the most intense few minutes of my day. Going into it knowing that it feels like you're fighting for your life. That year, I lost every match, and in wrestling, your record is a symbol of your strength and the amount of respect that you get. Considering I was 0-7, every match became harder and harder to face. I also quickly learned that wrestling is a very personal sport. You only get out what you put in, because in the match, you're the only person who can fight for yourself. I also learned the unique connection that you have to the person that you're going against. You don't know exactly you don't know the other person very well, but one thing that brings you together is that you both want to win, and that's why you're on the mat together. Fast forward to my season in eighth grade. This year I was much more excited than I was in seventh grade. I knew my strengths and weaknesses, and I felt much more confident. I can remember winning my first match on February 13th, 2019. I was overjoyed, and I couldn't wait to tell everyone that I knew. Ms. Rosetto also helped put together a meet with 19 other female wrestlers from around Nassau County, where we got to compete against each other and talk to each other about the experience that we had. 
Seeing how many other people were in the same position as I was made it that much easier to keep going with the sport. An article was also published in the Herald about my experience as a wrestler and about the meet as a whole. The next fall, I entered high school, where I joined the JV, vars the JV wrestling team. This time, it was much different than when I was in eighth grade. Now I was back to being the smallest person on the team again. It became very difficult to find any joy out of what I was doing, because things always seemed impossible. I was 14 years old, training with basically grown men. It became very difficult to see how I could ever live up to that at such an intense level when I felt so weak. Into the season, my friend Alex joined. We helped continue to pave the way for incoming female wrestlers in the district. Ms. Rosetto helped put together a meet with lots of other female wrestlers from around Long Island, including Suffolk County. And Alex and I spoke to all the female students at Southside Middle School. Although no more female wrestlers have joined, getting the word out has really helped create a spark in Rockville Center and around Nassau County. I did okay the rest of my high school season. I can remember my last match, waiting to get weighed in. It was a Saturday morning, February 1st, 2020. I can remember reflecting on my experience as, in wrestling as a whole and wondering when this cycle was going to end. Going to practice, going to meets, not really enjoying myself that much. I soon realized that this would be the last match. This was the end, and I couldn't go any further. Once I reached my limit, I soon realized what, life, what other things life held. This is not a success story. Yes, I was the first female wrestler at Southside Middle School and High School, but I was ready to move on, find bigger and better things in life. In the end, though, I was grateful that I was allowed to wrestle, even though I was a girl and most of my teammates were boys. But more importantly, I learned what it means to do what you love. Since moving on from wrestling, I joined Southside's varsity swim and dive team, where I competed at counties for four year, uh, three years, divisions for four years, and was nominated as captain my junior and senior year. I found that no matter how much I practiced wrestling, it wouldn't bring me the same joy that swim did because I didn't enjoy myself. So my final message is to always be open to try new things. If I hadn't been so open to wrestling, wondering about what it could offer me, I wouldn't have learned about myself in such a unique way. And if I hadn't been curious about swimming, then I wouldn't have found such joy in an exciting sport. So always be open to trying new things. You never know where life will take you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Please join me now in welcoming to the stage Paniotti Georgilis. All right, everybody. I get it. I get it. I get it. You all tend to feel alone sometimes. You really do. And you just need that somebody to talk to. But some people have a lot of people that they talk to. Everybody wants to be friends with you, right? You could certainly assume so, given that you talk to them a lot. You really could. But what if one day, you just had a really bad day. You needed to vent. You needed somebody to come by your side and say, it's OK, everything will be OK. Or maybe just give you some advice if you ask for it. When you need that kind of person, that kind of person is the definition of a friend. If you talk to a lot of people, and you have a bad day. Are all those people going to want to come and be by your side? 
Or more importantly, would you want them to? What if all these people that you talk to in passing knew all your problems, just, just knew everything about you? Can you trust them to keep it a secret and just not make fun of you? Just think about that for a second. I mean, for me, I certainly had a lot of people that I talked to in my early life. But with my friends, uh, I don't know. Because when I was five years old, my mom certainly thought that I should get out and make some friends which I didn't understand at the time. I did grow up with autism, where you really don't really want to just go out and talk to people. You don't, or at least I didn't. And so I kind of kept to myself. I really did. I would always forget about the concept of just going out and making a bunch of friends, because I just didn't care. I would go around elementary school talking to all these people, some of them being my somewhat friends, some of them even having some quite good empathy for me. And they would have a lot of drama. And I was in my own world and not theirs. Oh, I felt left out sometimes. Oh, I definitely did. Better believe I did is all my relationships just stayed in school when it came to friends. Didn't really go outside or play dates or anything like that. And I just was happy. I had my family. And I just, just to myself, didn't really matter. Did I feel alone? At times, but I had my family. And then... dun da 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 da, da. I moved. It was in eighth grade. And I had some people I was talking to beforehand who I thought were my friends. But then I would reach out to them and then pretty much gave up when it seemed like I was trying harder than they were. And that was just the right thing to do. Of course, then ninth grade came along and I was with all these people that I wanted to kind of talk to and make friends with. Oh, that's still not there. Anyway, when I made friends, with, when I talked to people, I didn't always, you know, feel right when I tried to do that and just try and make friends and all that stuff. Didn't feel right. Because it felt like I was always having to put in a lot of effort. And it felt like when it was time to put in effort back towards me, it just didn't feel right. Which made ninth grade and a lot of 12th grade quite hard. But you know, in 10th grade, it started to change. It started to change when I went to a park. And I had this friend, and I had somebody that knew me from a month ago from this other person who I thought was really becoming a true friend and just started talking to me. We just had a conversation and laughed it off. And laughed and laughed. And it was nice. But I still had that pressure after that because that wasn't very solidified yet at the time. So I still had that pressure to try and make friends. And it slowly faded away as 10th grade went on. And I started talking to this friend more. And I had a few others that I didn't have to put a lot of effort into, except for the, like the basics. Well, fast forward to the summer before 11th grade. I met someone in a cafeteria who was going to be count like another counseling staff, like I was going to be at a summer camp called Merrick Woods Day Camp in summer 2022. It took little conversation 
We just started talking and became friends that way. And it didn't seem very hard at all. And I came back into 11th grade knowing that it's not hard at all. My friend that I mentioned earlier, got, that person and I got really close this year. And so, while I may have a few friends now, I want you all to know something. If you feel that you have a friendship, that you feel you have no voice in, I don't know why you're putting so much time and effort when nothing's coming back to you. It's okay to expect, uh, it's okay to expect the love and respect that you give somebody else back to you. And the little friends that can give you that, that could help fill in your nerd when you feel lonely, when you need them the most, those are the people that you cherish. And if they don't, but you still feel like they're good friends, and if they're coachable, that's good. But the quality of your friendships are more valuable than having more friends and saying that you're popular. Thank you. We would now like to welcome to the stage our, our next presenter, Haley Ferraro Rich. Before I begin, I would like to ask a question that I find very fascinating to hear the answer to. And it is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, when I was a kid and I was asked this, personally, I would first answer with a mermaid then said a race car driver, and then once Frozen came out, I moved to a snow princess. And it wasn't until middle school where I actually thought of something with a stable salary. However, as I progressed through school, I found a love for science. I really found myself interested in biology and the human body, and that, paired with my family's really, uh, emphasis on service, I really thought being a doctor was for me. Now, both my grandparents served in the military, one in the Army, the other in the Navy, and my father has been an active member in the FDNY for years, while my mom has been a lawyer advocating for people's rights. Service was something that was really integrated, integrated into, my well -be into my growing up. It was something I valued, and I knew that whatever I wanted to do in my life, I wanted to help the others. So I thought being a doctor in medicine would be the perfect way to do so, until I came to high school. As I was help picking out my freshman year classes, a course called Intro to Occupation stood out to my mother. Now, I'll be honest, I had no idea what it meant, but it was an Intro to Business course. So, of course, my mother said, it'll be a good foundation, you should take it. If you don't like it, you'll never have to do it again. So, I didn't really have a choice. I mean, the class was good. It was with my friends, pretty easy. And in the beginning of the year, I remember being lectured by a, fresh, uh, by a senior at the time about some, called DECA, some club called DECA. Now, I kind of looked like all of you do right now, thinking, what the heck is DECA? Like, what is this? And um, I'll be honest, I was scared into it. When a senior tells you to join a club as a freshman, you join a club. So I signed myself up. And for those of you who don't know what DECA is, it is a business club. Um, most competitors do things called role plays, which essentially means you get a case study, you're given 10 minutes to read over that case study, find a business solution to the issue presented to you, and then have to give a 15-minute presentation to a judge explaining how you resolve that issue. Um, DECA is a, well, a nationally recognized club, and unfortunately, it does come with a price tag for members. You have to pay for membership and for all the events. So I did it, and I went into the regional competition, again, having no idea what I was even talking about, and somehow qualified for the state competition, which meant I was going to be sent to Rochester, New York in February of my freshman year to compete again. Now, going to this, I was a little nervous. Uh, going on a school trip, especially in a very career, educationally based club, I felt, felt a little under the stigma of being a nerd and going into something nerdy, and I was a little scared about it. 
However, once I actually got there, I was completely wrong about everything I thought. That experience was something that was monumental in my high school career. Me and a couple other freshmen who I was friendly with, not great friends with, but friendly with, had a great time. We were just hanging out, getting to know each other. We were able to network with kids from all over New York who shared common interests with us. It was a great experience. And although I didn't do very well, didn't do successful in the competition, I still had a great time. And I was very excited to apply all of those skills I learned that year. Presentation skills, professional skills, how to network and collaborate with others, learning how to actually talk in front of someone. I was excited to come back my sophomore year and be able to implement that. Unfortunately, sophomore year was COVID for me, so I was unable to do that in person and had to do my competitions virtually. I did qualify for states again and competed at the state competition. However, there was no nationals, no trip, no fun trip out of the state for us, but it was still a great experience. I was most shocked that year when my advisor, Mr. English, who's out there in the crowd, spoke to me after that season. He asked me if I wanted to be club president which, let me tell you, I wanted no part in doing. I was very overwhelmed by taking over such a big role, one, because I didn't even apply for it, and two, because I was a junior who would be leading some seniors. However, I was talked into it. I really found a passion for DECA and thought that even though I just completed one full year with it, I learned so many skills, not even business-wise, but life skills just being able to have a conversation. I bought a blazer when I was in sophomore in high school. I didn't even know you wear blazers. It was very interesting and a great experience that I thought not only I could help and other people share with, but I could embrace upon myself and only get better from there. Along with asking me to be president, Mr. English asked me to be a part of this sales project. As I mentioned before, DECA is a club that comes with a price tag. Unfortunately, not every student is able to take advantage of the club due to that price tag. So he asked me and my two friends, Catherine Medeiros and Gavin Goodlad, who are now very, very close with, to join this team and help Southside High School resolve that financial gap. We wanted every student to be able to take advantage of such a meaningful opportunity, and by this project, we were going to do that. So we started planning immediately. And I mean immediately, meaning we procrastinated to the night before. We, ha we held a run-a-thon, or a virtual run, where people were sponsoring our members to run and raise money for our club. It worked. It was individual fundraising, so however much people you got to sponsor you is however much money you would get for the, your events. It worked, and we actually won first place at the state competition with that project, and we were able to go to Atlanta for the ICDC, the International Career, uh, the International Career DECA Conference. It was an amazing experience. Me and all my friends got to go to Atlanta, Georgia, hang out, compete, and all that was fun, it was also so impactful for us. We were able to relate and collaborate and network with kids from all over the country who are in such a similar position as us. Being able to find common interests and be able to relate to them and talk to them not only about business and DECA, but also life. It was such an enriching experience and one that I, at that moment, I knew that other people had to take advantage of us. Going into our senior year, with the administration changes at Southside High School, the introduction of Mr. Gavin into our administration, and his goals of bridging the gap between the community and the school was something we wanted to include in our project. Not only has DECA been spreading throughout our district, but in, our, in the country as a whole, many kids are joining and taking advantage of these opportunities. And by being able to establish such relations with the community, we could help them get that business background that can not only help them in competitions, but help them gain experience for life, for future jobs, and just life experience. For our project last year, we reached out to local companies such as Farring's Deli, Parma Market, Parmigiani, Slider Joe's, and we established what we call Restaurant Week. So on a specific day, people would come, buy food from those restaurants, and a percentage of the profits would come back to our club. It was a great way to fundraise, and it was a way for us to fundraise for the club, allowing everyone to receive some of the funding, and all of the uh, students have that opportunity, rather than just some. We also met with Mr. Gavin discussing our fundraising plans, and he helped us rework the budget to fit the growing need and desire for DECA students. 
It was a great opportunity and gave me not only the ability to help my peers, but to establish relations. I'm now very close with Mr. English, as I literally texted him earlier today of how scared I was for this presentation. And I am now friendly with the superintendent. I've also created great bonds with, my, with Catherine and Gavin, who are now, I can say, two of my best friends. And I'm just overall more happy presenting myself and talking to individuals. I'm able to make those connections now because of this club. After competing, we won second place at the state competition with that paper, and we're able to spend our spring break in Orlando. Once again, we networked, met new people, made memories. We now have a great group, and we still text in our group chat almost weekly. It was a great experience, and I was so happy to be able to use this project, leave our legacy on Southside High School, and be able to help future students take advantage of the opportunities that could present them. Now, that I'm looking back as a senior, I'm happy to say that take, participating in DECO is something I'm proud of doing, and I'm happy that I did. I, now I can say that I did this club because I was a little scared of a senior. However, if I was telling an underclassman, I would definitely say do it, not to scare them, but to tell them of how enriching this opportunity has been. I am now more prepared for any college endeavor I have, any job I'll have, having conversations, meeting people. It is just so comforting to know that these skills will help me in life. Through DECA, I've not only learned these life skills, but I've learned more about what business is. I learned about finance, marketing, all these different things that are not necessarily taught in a high school classroom. Luckily, I figured out what I wanted to do with my life in high school. I'm now hoping to look at more of the administrative, administrative aspects of things to help people receive these opportunities instead of just giving them to them. Because of this and DECA, I will be studying business at the University of Florida next year, and I'm so excited to take on my new career path. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. It is now my pleasure to welcome Mrs. Mary Coleman to the stage. Good evening. I've always taken pictures, and I've found nature to be my favorite subject. About five years ago, I heard about an eagle, bald eagle pair in Centerport, New York, and I decided I just had to go see them. Well, that began my journey into serious photography. Photography was a blessing for me during COVID. I could go out, I could take pictures without really meeting anyone else. I realized that photography had become my zen, my place of peace, a place for me to forget all the craziness that was going on. When I'm observing an animal, it's usually a bird in the wild. I think of nothing else. Everything leaves my mind and I feel at peace. Even now, after a busy week in school, I make sure to find time at least a couple of hours every weekend to get out into nature to take pictures. If I don't, I find I'm less peaceful and a little grumpier. In preparing this talk, I came to realize that photography has been more than my zen. Through photography, I've learned some really important life lessons, and I'd like to share them with you. The first lesson is to be patient, to observe, to wait. When photographing a bird, you need to watch. You eventually learn their habits. Here's a cool one. Did you know that a bald eagle poops right before they fly? Well, when I see this happen, you know my camera's ready to get that eagle in flight. How does this translate into everyday life? Well, I do try to live my life by being patient, not always successful, and observing, by not judging, not judging and jumping in with my opinion, because I, I think all of us, miss so much because we're in a hurry or because we need to be right. Sometimes we're so quick that we fail to notice when the person we're closest to is happy or sad, upset 
or worried. So take time to observe. The second lesson I learned happened one day when I was taking a picture of eagles and there was a branch in the way. And I kept thinking to myself, man, if only that eagle would move. That branch is really ruining this picture. Well, it finally dawned on me that I could move. And so I took a few steps to the right and no more branch. In life, we need to do the same thing. Perhaps if we move a little to the right or to the left, our perspective will change. Sometimes we need to take a step back, look at things from a different angle. Sometimes that movement comes from listening to others who think differently than we do. I think it's really important to be ready to change our perspective. The third lesson goes with the other two, and that is listen. I will often hear a bird before I see it, and this is especially true for the little birds and warblers. They hide in bushes, but they sing such beautiful songs. With time, with patience, and allowing my ears to focus my eyes, I've been able to get some beautiful pictures of these elusive birds. The same is true in life. Listen, really listen, and try to hear what another person is saying, especially when they're speaking without words. Maybe if we do that, we'll really see them for the first time. The fourth lesson is one I try to hammer into my students all the time, that it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to miss a shot. Sometimes a mistake will give you a funny story, or a funny picture, or maybe a lesson to learn. Trust me, I've missed many a shot and have had to laugh at some of the results. Last year, my husband and I visited a wolf sanctuary. I was really excited because I'd never seen a wolf in person. The person there was getting ready to throw a piece of meat to a wolf. And I said, what a cool picture I could get if I could get her catching the food. And so here's my sequence of photos. Here she is saying, I see it. It's all mine. I can almost taste it. Uh, come on and throw it already. And finally, I got it, but I didn't. <laughs> she got the meat, I didn't get the picture. Because in my excitement, I forgot to follow her head with my camera, and so I missed the shot. In life, it's okay to make mistakes. And the final lesson is to always shoot in raw. For those of you who may not know, Raw photos contain all the digital information of that picture, much of which we don't notice with our own eyes. As a photographer, it's necessary to process each raw photo in order to bring out that information. Sometimes, a simple crop will give a very different perspective. I almost deleted this photo until I cropped in and saw this. Often as I process a photo, I see things my eyes didn't. Another bird in a tree, a beautiful flower, the detail of the feathers, so too in life. You know, it's really important to process our day, to take time each day to reflect on what happened. Could you imagine what, how it would be if we did that in our relationships? Do we judge someone by what we see on the surface, or by what others have said, or by one encounter? Or do we give them time? Do we really listen, observe, ask questions? Do we allow the other person to be themselves? Do we help bring out all the beauty that is in them? For you see, in reality, we're all raw. And we need each other to help bring out the beauty that is within. I would have never imagined that I would learn so much by looking through a viewfinder and clicking a button. But I have, 
and I hope I will continue to learn. And so, in life, be patient, observe, listen, reflect, be ready to change your perspective, forgive, forgive yourself when you make mistakes, forgive others, don't forget to ask for forgiveness. And always, always try to find the beauty that lies within you, as well as the beauty that's sitting right next to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Coleman, that was beautiful. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Ms. Grace Kilargian. By show of hands, how many of you in the audience as a child has heard from an adult, either directly or indirectly, the phrase, they are so mature for their age? That's a lot of people. If you have, you'll know what I'm about to talk about. But if you haven't, Consider a scenario in which you embody a shy little kid at a dinner party hosted by your parents and the guests are family friends. Consider you've heard such a phrase before in various different contexts from various different adults. And they were those kinds of adults who your parents knew at one point, drifted apart, and then got, to back, got back together by some obscure circumstance where you just happened to be a side character. Except for this time, you're eight, maybe 10, maybe 13 now, and these strange adults that previewed you when you were an infant, infant now find you a novelty. You're so mature for your age. But the strange thing is, you haven't spoken to these adults. You don't even remember meeting them. You've stood meekly behind your mom, tugging, tugging at her skirt, waiting for her to finish her conversation with this lady with these pointy red glasses frames who will lean down at you and ask, and, and tell you after the conversation is finished, she's so mature for her age. And then the gears behind your wide little eyes begin to churn, and you start relating the concept of maturity to the extent to which you can remain quiet and reserved and out of the way. Now let's place that little scenario I've just given you in the back of your minds for just a second, because it'll, it'll make sense in a little bit. As I grew as a quiet child, my perspective of reality shifted, as it does for all of us. A childhood is bound in to experience love and excitement and infatuation just the same as it is bound to experience disappointment and failure and loss. There's no way around it. It's a delicate balance. And simultaneously, it's an environment where the development of one's perspective thrives. I was a kid whose childhood could be considered relatively problematic, and by that I mean I experienced many struggles early on that shifted the way that I viewed the world. I suppose I, those, I owe those struggles some form of gratitude as well, as it made me a relatively philosophical person. It helped me in school, and it's helping me to create this very talk right now. However, those these premises these premature struggles also caused me to become a relatively shy and withdrawn kid. I generally preferred to be a fly on the wall. I was content knowing that I was the background character in someone else's story. I found it easier to avoid the sting of a letdown if I didn't allow myself to behave as freely childlike and expressive as other kids around me behaved. It was essentially a self-preservation tactic rooted in pessimism. And that's where the hypothetical scenario gave you I uh, gave you before comes in. Because of this withdrawn nature, I often brought out that comment from adults, she's so mature for her age. I've been told that just about as long as I remember, even from my own mother, who I hold nothing against her, I love you mom. I took great pride in this comment. It made me feel like I had to be doing, doing something right, that I was special in some way. But of course, past a certain age, maturity is expected of you. At that point, you are expected to experience those, those obstacles, those struggles, hurdles that life has you jump through. And you're expected to show those struggles on your person in the form of maturity. And that means that in this context, maturity is the extent to which you have accepted life's disappointments and struggles. 
And just consider how unfair that sounds. I like to relate the mysterious process of growing up, ironically, to a journey down into the, the mysterious world of the ocean. Because metaphors are some of my favorite ways. Metaphors are some of my favorite ways of conveying a message. Consider this. As you age, the onset of reality creates a pressure on you. It's as if you're alone in a submarine made of plastic, those little yellow ones that you can find at the dollar store with the little wind-up. And the older you get, the deeper you sink, with the hopes that at the bottom of this mysterious trench of life, there's going to be answers, some enlightenment, something that will answer these questions that you haven't even asked yet as a little kid. But it's a journey that none of us are quite prepared for. And we realize this fact only when obst unforeseen obstacles begin to drag us off of our course. As we make this journey, we must learn how to overcome and adapt to these obstacles. And while those skills that we learn from doing so are useful in life, they distract us from the goal that we were born with. That goal of discovery, innocent curiosity, which allows us to appreciate the ride. Stop and smell the flowers, as they say, rather than become invested in the maintenance of your vessel. Despite what some claim, the brain can never truly multitask. Rather, it juggles where our focus lies in any given moment. As young kids, we have nothing to pull ourselves away from that thrill of discovery. But as we grow, more free radicals pile up, and, they, and it begins to distract us. And that focus must be spread out across a myriad of different responsibilities and projects and obstacles that take up our time and energy. As you descend, slowly, you're no, you're no longer looking at life through that dry little porthole. Slowly, those things that they tell you are part of growing up start to intrude. You can feel the chill of the water splash your face. You can taste the salt on your tongue. It's thrilling, it's terrifying, and your excitement to find some ultimate solution to the question of life is dampened by your frantic attempt to patch those leaks in your little yellow submarine. And that is growing up. Now, I want you to remember an experience you had as you were just beginning that journey into the depths of life in your little yellow submarine. I want you to recall a happy memory in which you were a young kid, just living in the moment, having fun. For example, when I was a kid, one of my favorite things in the whole world was to make those little dribble castles at the beach, if any of you know what I'm talking about. The ones where you grab a fistful of super, super wet, saturated sand and let it slip through your fingers and create little towers right before your eyes. To me, it had to be magic at the time, creating very, my very own kingdoms with their very own narratives, their little stories that only I knew. I never knew how much value such experiences had. Nothing made sense, and yet everything made sense on some level where the chaos and unanswered questions that come with life were accepted as unanswered. Ignorance is bliss, and you were content knowing you were content being in the dark because you had no idea that there was an option to step out into the burning heat of the sun. You had nothing to clutter your schedule. None of the things they tell you are part of growing up, hiding at the back of your mind. School, work, for some of us it's even kids. It was simple, authentic freedom. And I think we all surely do miss it to some extent, despite how far we've all come in our own unique journeys. We're all too busy now. There is no restoring that balance of focus. We're working too hard trying to achieve our dreams. I ask you, if, if maturity is birthed from struggle and the clutter of growing up, why is it that such a phrase in compliments to my maturity as a little kid brought me so much satisfaction? Why must, my, why must such a sacrificial cycle of emotion be so praised by those who children look up to for guidance? Why is it that maturity so highly valued must be so intertwined with our loss of childlike wonder? 
which comes from the moment we're born. I ask you to think of all of those happy memories contained within you, those specialized and unique games you would play with your friends as a kid in the backyard for hours. The awaiting storm that was future responsibility felt like nothing but a sweet breeze on a sweet summer afternoon. You were among the flowers, and the smell of that incoming storm was engrossed by the scent of sweet peonies and daffodils, such flowers exclusive to that sweet spring day. I encourage you all to appreciate the innocence of childhood while it lasts. Rather than attempt to teach the kids of each generation to adapt to a, mature, to a mature persona and to fill their schedules and expose them to the struggle of time and mental health management, allow them to stretch that window of infatuation that we're all born with, where they can focus on taking in the beauty. Recognize that after a certain point, they won't be able to return to that sweet spring day. They won't be able to return to the smell of daffodils and the sound of laughter of friends playing in the backyard, the sunlight zone in their journey to the depths of life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. And now it's my pleasure to invite to the Red Ted Circle, Miss Lucy Frain. There's one thing that every single person in this room shares. Everyone has in common the fact that they get up in the morning and they get changed. It's something that not a lot of people think of. It's just another chore like brushing your teeth or eating breakfast. But to some people, it's a lot more. When I was in seventh grade, I would wear the exact same pair of black leggings to school every single day. I, it was the only thing that I really felt confident in. It's, <laughs> these are pictures of me from seventh grade. <laughs> it was the only thing I really felt pretty in and the only thing I wore to school. And I realized that I couldn't, I was struggling with, you know, schoolwork and making friends and I didn't really think about that a lot, of how that relates to my external clothing and stuff. <laughs> and then over the summer of eighth grade, I started to gain confidence and I started experimenting with my style. And I would wear different outfits and it made me really happy. And I started to gain, and I started feeling, you know, more confident in what I wore. And the first day of eighth grade, I was so nervous. I wore this outfit. It's a really bad photo. Oh, wow, that's really bad. <laughs> I wore this outfit to school, and I w felt like everyone was staring at me. I was so embarrassed, and it took me a while to overcome the nerves of um, wearing this. And throughout the year, I would wear other skirts and jeans and other clothing that I wouldn't wear in the previous year. And I realized something that um, over the COVID quarantine, when we had virtual school, I would get up, I would turn on my Zoom, I would join my meeting, and then I would fall right back asleep because I was in my pajamas. And one time my parents caught me doing it and my dad said something that I think about every day. He told me that the way you dress is the way you feel. And how can you accomplish what you want to accomplish during the day if you're not dressed ready for it? And at the time, I didn't really understand it, but throughout eighth grade, I did. And along with that, I also understood and realized that I wanted to be a good role model for my little sister. I have a sister and her name is Haley and my whole life I've wanted to be someone she looks up to and 
be someone she could come to and, you know, as I said, a role model. And I realized, how can I ever be that person if I don't put an effort into myself and if I don't feel as I want to? And now I, from eighth grade till now, I realized that I want to feel like this and what you wear on the outside also has to do with your mood and how you feel on the inside. And I want to feel confident and I want to feel like I can wear anything and do anything. And there's always gonna be people who judge you no matter what you do. And I want to get through that in all the hardships in life looking fabulous and pretty and I want to feel confident in myself. And I want everyone to feel as I do. And I want everyone to feel happy with themselves. And after this event, I want you to look down at your clothing and think, is this what I want to wear? Or is this how I feel I have to wear? Thank you. All right, our final speaker of the evening is Adriana Tuminello. When the college of my dreams posed me with the question, what is the truest thing you know? I knew I would not say, do we know anything to be true? The normalization of humans questioning the reality of life is not beneficial to society. Why should people be taught to question the aspects of life that keep them going? Why should children be taught to question the things they love or the things that give one purpose? Anyways, the truest thing I know is that everyone is afraid of something, whether it is present in their conscious minds or not. Thank you. Fear is one of the most important aspects of human functionality. All anxiety is caused by fear. As I grew up, I watched the levels of anxiety rise in not just myself and my family and my friends, but also in the statistics around the world. Humans create their own fear, which is a flaw of our incredible brains. But as horrible as fear is, where would an organism be without it? And should we see it as a flaw? Fear is so necessary for not just growing, but surviving. Fear promotes security for the body it runs. What makes fear so true is the fact that fear is hardwired into the brain. It is human nature to be fearful, and every aspect of a human body is purpose. People are meant to be afraid of things, whether being afraid keeps them out of danger or causes them to perform better in any aspect. Therefore, since we have come to the conclusion that fear is an emotion that individuals possess for the means of protection, there must be a way for one to grasp a hold of their fear and use it to their advantage. Ask yourself the following questions. Why am I afraid? Do I want to be afraid? Do I need to be afraid? And what can I do to comfort myself? These four questions, <laughs> these four questions help your mind exercise what the root of your fear may be while distracting you from the emotion that you are dreading, fear. Standing here today, I have fear, which some of you can see. Um, not the fear of speaking in front of a crowd, or in front of an audience, but the fear that I'm boring you or I'm telling you something you already know. I'm afraid because I want to be seen as intelligent. I want to open the eyes of my audience. And that answers my first question, why am I afraid? For my second question, do I want to be afraid? Um, I definitely do not want to be afraid. We all know it is not the best feeling. I am afraid because I want Oh, I said this already. <laughs> because I want to be seen as intelligent. Do I need to be afraid? I am merely having a conversation about a thought in front of an audience of people I may see again who love me or I may never see again. So no, I don't need to be afraid. What can I do to comfort myself? I can look in the audience and know and hope that at least one person can walk away thinking she got in front of an audience and she spoke about something she's passionate about or maybe thinking of fear. 
Next time you find yourself lingering within your own fear, find it in yourself to step back from the situation and realize that you don't need to be afraid of your own fear. Thank you. <sighs> Let's have another round of applause for all of our presenters. <clears throat> So thank you so much for joining us tonight for our very first ever TED Ed evening here at Southside High School. We hope you enjoyed our student and faculty talks. We hope you leave feeling inspired to identify your own passions and your own ideas worth sharing. We hope that you'll stick around for a few moments and join us for some refreshments in the lobby and congratulate our speakers. My, on behalf of myself and Ms. Brown, we are incredibly proud of these amazing students and faculty members who took their time to do this with us tonight. Thank you all for coming and being part of this experience. Good evening. Good night. <laughs>